All right. It is sister straight talk about teenagers, the state of the union. Alex, this is always one of my favorite things to do with you. I love to just really hash out the series together. Yeah. This has been a doozy because life is a doozy. (laughs) If you as a listener wonder, I wonder what Krista and Alex are struggling with these days. You can just push play and hear who we've asked to come on and give us advice on how to live our lives. So we decided when we, I don't know, a month ago, a couple months ago that we wanted to do a series on parenting teenagers because we are, and it's hard and we're surrounded by other people, our friends in our actual lives that are uh, trying to help their teenagers navigate the world right now. And um, it's just really hard. And I will say things in our house have been hard, but things in the houses around me too, in my circle, kids are, it's like we've turned this year corner with the pandemic and everybody is just coming apart, not just at the seams, but melting almost. (laughs) I've heard that a lot actually Mm -hmm. from parents. And I think kids who have been in school more are having less of that, which is interesting Mm -hmm. because I think it's that structure piece, Mm -hmm. but for kids who have really been home all year, I've just, it's like the, it's the tipping point, you know, Mm -hmm. there's always a tipping point and every kid's different on that, but, (laughs) and it is tipped. Yes. (laughs) We have tipped over. Um, yes. So that is why we, uh, invited the people on that we did and that we wanted to talk about this because we see it and we hear it in our lives, in our homes and in the places right around us. Mm -hmm. So Krista, let's just talk about what, what this series was for us. What did you learn from these wonderful? Can we just stop here and say what wonderful guests we had on? I know. So good. And I, here's the deal. And I, you know, I say this all the time to you, but you know, when people are talking about teenagers, like, well, basically everyone stops talking because, you know, teenagers, it's like one day it's the best thing that ever happened. We just can't believe that we get to do this, you know, older (laughs) kid thing with our children and it's so fun and we see them. And then the next day, you know, it like plummets and we're like down in the depths because, you know, something's happened and it's, you know, it's just, I think there's a lot of Um, back and forth with teenagers. And so a lot of people feel like they're on unsteady ground. And I think what's so helpful about these guests is I think they offered us tools for our toolbox so that we don't have to say in those moments, oh my gosh, what do I do? We can go, oh, okay. I remember when David was, Thomas was on, he talked about the four emotional milestones. And like, for me personally, that was really interesting to hear him talk about the four emotional milestones. So, you know, what are four ways that we can help our kids to name their feelings? And so he went through, I'm just going to remind everybody, cause I have to be reminded all the time, but the four things are give them vocabulary to name what they're feeling, help them to have perspective about where it fits in their life. So it's like the pain scale from one to 10. What I really liked about what he said there is that we have a whole generation of kids who like something happens and it's just automatically a 10. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I want to camp on this one a little bit because I've heard Sissy Goff talk about this too, with her new book about girls and anxiety and depression that it used to be like when a girl left you out of something, you were sad. And that was probably a four. Well, she said (laughs) now, you know, they posted on social media, they feel completely alone And now the girls are going to a 10 and they're in a full-blown depression over it or worse. And so, you know, just on, on that perspective, you know, line, how do we help our kids like know, you know, the pain scale a little bit and help them regulate so that everything's not a 10, you know, I thought that was really Mm -hmm. good. So I like that. And then um, the other two are empathy which we hear about all the time, but as an essential ingredient. So how do we help 
build empathy in our kids and then resourcefulness, you know, taking the emotion to something constructive. Mm -hmm. So if they are feeling something that's really hard, that we help them to think about how can I be resourceful in this problem? And this is where you and I, I feel like, Hey, our third way thinking thing that we talk about all the time, this is where that comes in. And my kids are actually talking about that a lot. Like they actually use the words third way thinking, like, how can I think about this more creatively? So I thought those were just gold. I mean, I would even, I would be willing even to put these in a little printable that we put in the show notes for today, because even if we had those up and, Mm -hmm. or we keep them in a book or a Bible or whatever, or journal. And then when our kids are really struggling emotionally, we can literally pull that out and say, which one do I need them to help my child with right now? Mm -hmm. Right. Because we hear that kids need to talk about their feelings, but then that's just left there. And we look at our teenager and say, how they don't know how to separate out their feelings. And this gives us some really specific how Mm -hmm. to approach that. So you're right. It was really good. Or like, let's say that, um, you know, your child is left out of something, but another girl was too. Well, oh my gosh, what, what an opportunity to talk about empathy. Mm -hmm. Like you're feeling that way. I wonder how Carrie feels. I bet Mm -hmm. she feels the same way. Do you think you could reach out to her? You know, I mean, just all of those things, right? It's like, oh, I didn't even think that maybe we could do that. So I felt like he just really shed some beautiful light on how we walk through that Mm -hmm. on heavy emotions with our kids. Yeah. And then I'd say the other thing, and this is all David Thomas, but I just, that episode was gold. Um, I just loved when he talked about the car analogy. I've heard a lot people talk about feelings, but I've never mm-hmm. heard that specific visual that actually they're in the back seat and they're buckled in. So, mm-hmm. you know, wasn't that good? Where it was he, really good. You mm-hmm. just talked about, you know, they're there. You acknowledge mm-hmm. that they're there, but they are buckled in in the back seat. They are not mm-hmm. driving the car. Right. And to treat them like children because you wouldn't let your child drive the car and you wouldn't. Mm-hmm. And you wouldn't put your child in the trunk. So it does. Is that happy? Like, where's the appropriate place? And, and it also reminds us too, that they're not the grownups in the room. The feelings are not the grownups that we need to be the grownups. Um, and then to help our kids grow in that it was really good. You know, Margot said something that I thought was similar in giving us some tools on the, how to talk about the feelings is she said, Uh, If we're talking about a task that often young people are very task focused and as parents, because the feelings feel so uh, unattainable, just, we don't know how to start in on that, or they feel volatile that we can talk about a task first and then ask, well, how do you feel about that? So that you are getting both the nuts and bolts of what needs to get done, but then helping them identify the feeling associated with the task. It just seemed like a real practical way to introduce that conversation to our kids um, in a way that isn't just walking up to them and saying, why are you sad? Which is Mm. what I often do. And that doesn't go well. Um, (laughs) Also, like if they have a big project, for example, you Mm -hmm. talk about the project first Mm -hmm. and then get into their overwhelm. Right. After. Right. Or they're having a conflict at work. Okay. How can you address this? And how are you feeling about having to address this? So you kind of get to the problem solving. And I think we, as people probably just personality wise tend to latch on to one side or another. We tend to be more feelings focused just in general or more task oriented. So that's just a good rule of thumb, I think for conversation, (laughs) like, Mm -hmm. let's talk about the practical and the feelings and it offers a balanced approach and that we don't need to be afraid of either or overwhelmed by either. Yeah, that's good. Um, and then Heather said something about teens being more lonely today than seniors. And that just struck me that here are two at kind of the two ends of the adult spectrum, uh, of life, that those are our two most isolated groups. It's just heartbreaking. Well, and I don't remember if she said this or not, because I've read articles about that. And so that's why I'm confusing what she said and what the article said, but, um, somewhere I read that it's the first time in history that has ever been true. Mm -hmm. And so that's, what's staggering to me is that this is not normal. This is actually the first time in all of history 
where they're finding that that youth are more lonely than the elderly. Like that's not a thing, you know, but it is now. And that's, it should wake us up. It should be disturbing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what have you changed or adopted because of what you've learned? Well, one thing that Margot talked about I thought Margot had some, she had a lot of little, I mean, she she was so great because she was, I mean, as we all know, I mean, Margot has a lot to say because she has years and years and years of experience, but she just dropped nuggets like all throughout that episode that, you know, we didn't really camp on because we were still moving to other things, but you know, there was just so many good recommendations. And one of the things she talked about was the family meeting which, um, you know, I've been doing morning meetings with the boys all year because we've been on hybrid school. So it's allowed me on the days that they're off to do these morning meetings with them. And it's really a touch point. We do, um, we've been doing first Peter. And so we've been reading through that together, but also it just gives me a time to talk with them, to discuss things, to find out where they're at about different, you know, topics. And also, Um, you know, it's a time for me to assign chores. It's a time for me to, you know, talk about how the rest of the day is going to go. And it's, it's just so amazing how much of a difference that touch point makes. And so, um, she mentioned that and it's something I'd already been doing all year, but I just, I just want to say, bring back the family meeting. It is, it really does work and, and, and kids don't, won't feel like it. They won't. And like Marco said that, you know, mm-hmm. after they'd had a house fire and it was so hard because the kids, that was the last thing they wanted to do. They weren't even at home during their family meetings, but it really is important. And if you do it, there's so much benefit to it, even if they don't want to do it, you know, mm-hmm. it just becomes, they kind of like, Oh, okay, well, this is what we're doing every couple of mm-hmm. weeks or especially if you have a routine and you can do it at the same time, then it just becomes a part of the family routine. Mm-hmm. So I would say I've just, I can just, you know, say, yeah, it's been a really great thing for us this year. And it's something Margot brought up that I thought was really helpful. Yeah. And I want to point out that not everybody in your family is part of that meeting that I think sometimes people get overwhelmed with, um, kind of like, Oh, everybody has to be here. There's never a time when everybody's here. Mm -hmm. And so for you, you're doing it with the kids who are there. Eric's not there. And last night we had an impromptu meeting, (laughs) but it just, we set up some structure to have a conversation about a given topic, um, with one of our children. And it just worked out better because we invited her into that space to say, we're going to talk about this right now. And it was almost like this micro family meeting, but it wasn't appropriate to invite everybody into that conversation. Mm -hmm. And so, I, I want to encourage parents too. If you feel like, well, I have this 17 year old, but I also have this seven year old that sometimes you can break it down small groups. Totally. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Or you could even start with everyone, do the things you do with everyone so that you feel that unity piece mm-hmm. and then say, okay, you guys can go. And now we've got some big kid stuff we need, you know, we're going to chat about. Mm-hmm. And that, you know, that's, the, there's always those third, but getting creative about how mm-hmm. you might do that, but you're yeah. right. Like Eric really hasn't been a part of those this year, but it hasn't taken away from the effectiveness. I think my kids feel heard. They feel known. They feel seen. They would not say those things <laughs> like I'm, but I, I, mm-hmm. I know that that's true, you know, mm-hmm. when they have that touch point with me. And I would say the other thing, you know, Rodney and Tracy, talking about, you know, how to talk with your kids about sex and pornography. I think it was just a reminder that it's an ongoing conversation that we as parents need to make sure is ongoing. So I think a lot of times we think, oh, we've covered that. (laughs) We've talked Mm -hmm. about it. And yet, um, it's something we have to keep talking about. So what I've changed is I actually am looking for opportunities to bring things up And, uh, I have several times since then, and I've just reinforced like, Hey, if you guys are ever in a spot, like, I just want you to know that like, there is no shame and that, you know, the, 
the best way to freedom is for us to talk openly about things. And so just reminding them that if they're ever in a space where they need to come to us, that they will only find love, acceptance, and grace and help and not ever, they don't have to feel that shame. So we just, I just keep revisiting that conversation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I noticed that a number of guests, no matter the topic said, it's not just one conversation, but lots of conversations. Um, that just is reminds us that parenting is about consistency and, uh, repeated messages over and over. You don't just tell someone, I love you once you tell them over and over, and you don't just tell someone something about a particular subject. Once you reinforce it over and over. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And just that, I think in particular with that conversation with Rodney and Tracy, just how ubiquitous this topic is for our kids, I think way more than we know, even as parents. And so I think just that whole idea that, you know, our kids are being educated on a regular basis about, I mean, culture is the sex ed, you know, and their devices are. And so you know, how do we counter that with healthy sexuality? I mean, it's a high call. It's hard. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What yeah. About I will say, um, I bought the book that Margot recommended or that she talked about a lot called the stressed years of their lives. Um, which really goes into college too. And, um, it's really good. I mean, I haven't finished it, but I'm reading it right now. And, uh, that was a good recommendation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've got it too. And I need to dive in. I just haven't, I'm finished. I'm making myself finish a book I'm reading by mm -hmm. John Mark Comer first, and then I'm going to mm -hmm. dive into that. But back to Rodney and Tracy, I thought they were good about saying, you know, we want to move our kids forward on this, but we're not going to expect, uh, perfectionism, or we're not going to expect that they're not going to stumble that it's, this is the, we want to move them in a direction. And I've been thinking a lot about my own perfectionist tendencies and not so much that, um, I want my kids to be perfect. That's not at all what I feel like I struggle with. I think sometimes my perfectionism gets into thinking that there is a right answer or a right way to do things. And I can transfer that belief system to my children that they have to choose one thing that's going to be the best choice. And that's a trap and that can add stress in their lives, no matter what kind of decision they're making. And so just being conscious of my own decision-making processes and my own expectations that I put on myself. And when I articulate those how that transfers to my children about their own expectations for themselves. I don't give myself a lot of permission to make mistakes. And so I don't give my kids the, the model they need to give themselves permission to make mistakes. I certainly expect them to make mistakes as their mom, but they're also absorbing what I believe about myself. And that I felt like that interview kind of highlighted that to me, not necessarily in that particular area of struggle, but just in my, whatever area of struggle I have, how am I modeling grace to myself? Um, I just, I've just been thinking a lot about that since then. Yeah. That's a really good jump. That's a good jump that you made from that. You know, it is, mm -hmm. I think that's, that's how we grow. Right. And one of the things when I'm life coaching, uh, we talk about how life coaching is like a graph and you go up and then you go down a little bit and you go up and you go down a little bit and you go up and you go down a little bit, but the trajectory overall is going up, but the graph will never have an even line going up. If that makes sense, it will always be a jagged line. Mm -hmm. Right. But that there's growth that's going, ultimately you're, you're headed in the right direction. And that to me has been helpful too, because just this whole idea that actually we learn 
and our kids learn from mistakes. And Mm -hmm. so to not expect that perfection, but actually to grow from it and then, okay, we're going to go back up again, you know, Mm -hmm. and actually maybe even surpass where we were before because of that mistake or because of that fall. So I think that's been helpful for me too, in bringing that to the conversation, Mm -hmm. you know, Heather's interview, I thought was just a great reminder of technology addiction Mm -hmm. and the fact that just like, we're not going to hand our kids a drug. Um, we have to be aware that technology is its, its own form of a drug, so to speak, it's its own addiction and that we really need to be aware of how much use we are <laughs> using technology first. And, and David said that as well. He said, you know, we, it, it's, it's hard to pass on what you don't have. I love that about his interview. And I think we talk about that all the time on here mm-hmm. that let's start with us. Well, and Rodney Tracy, I mean, they said that over and over, mm-hmm. right? You mm-hmm. have to get healthy first in your own you know, sexual history and past and heal, and then you can help your kids. So, um, you know, but that's what technology too, is that we have to look at our own habits. And then secondly, you know, how do we help our kids and put in some structures that allow them breaks because their brains are being wired for it. And that was, that was just a sobering reminder to me. Mm -hmm. And especially this year, because Mm -hmm. so many kids have been doing school through a screen. Mm -hmm. It's like, then they get off and often in our house, the default is, well, I'm going to go do something on a screen. I'm like, I'm out. But -hmm. then I have to offer them an alternative and that takes work and time. Yeah. Well, and in hard parenting, and can we just speak Mm -hmm. to that for a minute? Like it's the harder way to parent. It's easy to let our kids have unlimited screen time. It's easy to say, yeah, 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 yeah. Here you go. Right. It's hard to do the other. And Mm -hmm. so like, I feel like we have to even find courage to do that and to like say, Nope, I'm the parent going back to, you know, talking about that a little bit in the beginning, like I'm the parent and I, this is good for you. And this is actually a hill I am going to die on. You know, we have to pick and choose, right? The battles we're going to fight. But I think Heather's interview reminded me that this is a worthy battle, that being healthy with technology and our relationship with technology is a worthy parenting battle. And so I I just feel like I have to constantly have that reminder because um, it's just all the time. And I see my kids picking up their technology all the time. We all are. There's not one of us that isn't at this point. Yeah. Okay. Well, what would you say, was there anything a guest said that you felt like you just want to make sure you take with you? What I already said that it's not a single conversation, but multiple conversations. So anytime something comes up in my head and I think, "Mm, should I say something? Oh, I've already said something. So I, I mean, there's a fine line between nagging, right? <laughs> but mm-hmm. it's conversations aren't meant to be nagging, but just how we approach things. I, I um, am trying to figure out how do I reinforce something without nagging? Mm-hmm. How do I say the same message different ways without nagging? So that's what I'm working on as we lead this series. Yeah. Questions are mm-hmm. great. I think with that, with teenagers, especially. Yeah, but then what if I don't like their answers? Yeah, that's hard. <laughs> that's hard. And I felt like. Then I don't feel like I'm reinforcing the message. Wasn't that Rodney and Tracy that you asked that to? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And they were good about saying, yeah, sometimes it doesn't, it doesn't work out. Mm-hmm. Um, I just think as I watch people who are ahead of me in parenting that have young adults And so many of them have heartache around their kids' decisions, life decisions. As a six, worst case scenario, this is what I'm doing right now. I'm preparing myself for that. Okay, by a six, I mean a six on the Enneagram. So we specialize in 
in imagining the worst case scenarios and how we would handle them so that when they come, we feel prepared. And uh, so I think a lot about, okay, what would be hard for me as a parent? And, um, and so I try to think about how can we still thrive as a family if, and it's really not if, it's when, because we're all human. When my kids make decisions that are different than mine, or I feel disappointed, um, how am I going to handle that in a way that feels healthy and supportive to them? So I appreciated their response and acknowledging that that's part of loving somebody. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think if there's anything, I mean, and this can get into a little bit what we've, you know, our two cents of having raised teenagers and we are actively raising teenagers is that God gives grace for the moment. And that is, you know, a little bit of a message of hope that I want to give to parents of teens is that what I've seen in my own life and I've experienced and a truth that I know about God is that he gives to the need at hand, but not before. And so I think so often we worry about this and we worry about that. Mm -hmm. And we worry that this, you know, but that God actually will deliver on time. So if one of those things comes to pass, he will give you and equip you what you need in that moment, but it won't happen before that. <laughs> so we won't feel equipped, you know, but it's interesting. The strength he gives as we walk through hard things, he does give it and he is present and he is there, but, um, but it's on his time. And in that way, you know, it's mm -hmm. that daily bread concept, right? That's so funny. I was just thinking that today when I was dropping our younger two off at school. So we have two that are still in elementary school, uh, but next year we'll just have one. And we have two neighbor um, girls that we carpool with. So I had four girls with me and I thought, I just love this age. <laughs> They're not teenagers. I just love this age where they are just talking about Harry Potter and um about all kinds of things that I think are fun and I don't have to stress about. Um, and I thought, and next year is going to be just one left. We've been at this school for 13 years now, this elementary school, and we'll have two more years left. And I thought there was a time when that would have made me so sad. Mm -hmm. And I feel totally fine with the fact that in a few years, we will not after 15 years, we will not be at that elementary school anymore that I'm ready and our family is ready, but more, I am ready. Yeah. And I never thought that would be true. Mm -hmm. And so it's easier for me to see that with my younger kids, mm -hmm. because I don't have kids that have gone all the way through the teen years yet, where I can have that, uh, retrospect mm -hmm. and perspective. So I think that is true. Yeah. You know, the other thing I thought was helpful was just David Thomas's talk about stances and when we're discussing the Enneagram and actually giving our kids language through the Enneagram about themselves and how they might be operating. And so one of the things that I'm incorporating now that I just haven't done a ton of work in the stance area, but him bringing that forward really is causing me to go back into some podcasts and to dive into that a little bit and how that impacts my kids. So I thought that was really helpful too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't really know anything about it, but I've been thinking about how do I find out? <laughs> mm -hmm. Because it is, I think helpful if it impacts how we play things out. Right. Exactly. And that's what it sounds like. It's how we play mm -hmm. out these tendencies um, of course that's going to be helpful. Yeah. So I thought that was a great, great suggestion. What else, Alex, just as far as your own expertise in parenting teenagers, would you bring to the table as <laughs> oh, this gosh. is like, you know, an important piece of this discussion? Well, I wouldn't say it's expertise because I do not feel, uh, well equipped these days. I will say things I am, trying not to be reactive to things. Uh, it's hard not to be. Uh, so I am trying to be proactive, but one thing that caught my eye just this week, I'm on a parents of teens, Facebook group for moms in my neighborhood. 
and a mom who's a social worker posted an article, and we'll put it in the show notes, about the rise in eating disorders during the pandemic and how it's just kind of coming to the surface now. And that caught my attention because in the circles that I'm in, I have been, I am experiencing watching families struggle with this and like never before. I mean, maybe once in a while, I would know a girl who was having a hard time, but it's like multiple girls that I love very much and their parents just feeling so overwhelmed. And so it, it was almost comforting. I wouldn't say it was really comforting, but it was helpful to know that this is a trend that is just coming to surface now. And it helped me see there's maybe larger things at play and it did have to do, they're, they're trying to figure out why. So in the article, they talk about, you know, medically, why is this happening? Why are we seeing this increase? And it must be related to something going on in the world right now. And it was the combination of isolation and social media and just that kids are spending so much more time looking at images online than they were pre-pandemic, even though they were too much already pre-pandemic, but as they're isolated, um, how that's impacting them. So just know that if that is something that is going on in your home, that you are not alone. And there are counselors who specialize in that particular struggle with kids. And what the article said is be looking for the kids that aren't the stereotypical eating disorder kid who they named in the article as the white teenage suburban girl. Um, those they're seeing an increase in that, but where they're seeing the increase is in unexpected populations. And so that is interesting too. Mm. Yeah. Super interesting. I mean, I don't have any solutions, but just to say that it's, it's a thing that we didn't cover in this series because it just seems to be even in real time coming forward as an issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Gosh. Okay. What about Um, you? What, um, what wisdom can you throw our way? I would just say getting to the why behind things that our Mm. kids are old when they're teenagers. I mean, they are able to think, and I think we sometimes underestimate the power of education. So like when we talk about why we should be on technology less and about technology addiction, well, let's make sure that we're doing the education piece around that because like, okay, let's talk brain science and what actually happens you know, in your brain, when your brain is being wired, you know, for these patterns, like actually pull up a diagram, you know, and there's so many resources online now that we can do that with and show the neuroscience behind it. So that when they're doing that, they're like, oh, they think of that and they know they're equipped a little more, um, to make that choice or not make that choice. And so just, you know, getting, getting behind the why of things, I think is always helpful because, because they can. And I think we forget sometimes that our kids' brains are fully capable of knowing the neuroscience behind it, for example. Mm -hmm. Um, I would also say, uh, oh, on that note, Ted talks, I think are a really great resource that we just don't utilize enough. I actually just played one for my kids yesterday during our morning meeting where I'm like, okay, we're going to talk today about positive psychology and you know, how, what that does in the brain and, and how, what, how you react to things, how you see the world matters. And so anyway, you know, things like that, those are just great resources. I would also say, um, to not forget play, which we didn't cover on this episode, just, you know, but we could have done a whole episode on this, but how do we incorporate play with our families? Because that's, especially with teenagers, like building those positive memories and experiences, it only connects us with all, all people for all time. But I think especially with teenagers, as we're struggling 
in other areas, like for example, maybe there's a lot of tension around certain subjects. So to find ways to have fun with them is key. I mean, it just, it's, I think it's just so important. And then along with that, get it on your calendar because we do make time for what we value. We do. And so, you know, get it on the calendar and it will happen. And even if you have to move it to a different spot, if it's on the calendar, you can move it to a different spot, but it's there and you know, it's actually going to happen. And as we're even in spring now, and you're starting to think about summer really, and you and I have done a whole series where we talk about how to plan for summer so that you don't miss it. But that's just such a natural time. I mean, we're getting out in nature, we're spending more time outside and it is an actual playground for us as families, you know, and to really nurture those relationships. So I would say play is huge. Um, Mm -hmm. And then I would also um, just say, don't forget about the family table rhythm. I think a lot of families, um, I've read different articles about how even during COVID, because people are feeling like they're on kind of this groundhog day rhythm, Mm -hmm. they've gotten out of the habit of family dinners because it's more like everyone's just kind of grabbing food and eating at the island or whatever. And that my encouragement would just be, you know, make dinner time, make it different, make it special, make it that touch point where everyone is sitting down together. And, you know, we're in a season now because sports are picking back up and whatnot, where we're having to adjust again. And sometimes, you know, like my son, one of my sons is doing driver's ed online every night, you know, for Mm -hmm. a specific period of time. But so it's, we're still sitting down at the dinner table with who can be at the table Mm -hmm. in that moment and then bringing him in after in another way. But, you know, just really making the family table a priority because I think we get lazy. I get, I can get lazy. You know, I think we all can just get lazy and, and yet that is a really, I mean, statistically, we can't argue with what research shows about the family table. It's actually super, super significant. And kids' risk factors go way down mm-hmm. in eating disorders. I mean, as one depression, suicide. I mean, it's kind of crazy mm-hmm. that just the one act of gathering around the table does all these things, prevents early pregnancy. I mean, the statistics, you can look them up are just staggering. And so it's, I think it's a really simple daily act that we can implement and value and make sure that we come back to again and again and again. Yeah. I am just thinking Jesus chose to do that the night before he died. (laughs) He could have done anything and he chose to sit with his disciples and have dinner. So that kind of puts some weight on it. Um, but because we can minimize the value of it, but we knew pre pandemic that it was an important thing, um, in the middle of really busy. And I think for a lot of families, it went from so busy where we had to really work at it to, Oh my gosh, I'm so sick of you. Cause I'm with you all the time. <laughs> and so how do we continue to make that an important thing? And fortunately I do think families are starting to have, some of their old routines back and more and more kids are back in school and more things are happening for teenagers outside of the home, but it's still, that doesn't mean that the importance hasn't gone away just because we've lived through a hard year. Right. Exactly. (laughs) Well, Alex, as we wrap up, what would you say are some resources that you can add to this conversation about parenting teenagers? Uh, I can't remember if David mentioned his uh, podcast that he has with Sissy raising boys and girls is a really great parenting podcast. I mean, just listen to David and you'll want to hear more. And so there he is on his own podcast. You'll hear more and you'll hear her wisdom too. And together there's just so much goodness. And uh, our friend Kristen has a podcast called redemptive parenting And, um, she has such, I'm trying to think of the right words of her approach. She has a gentle approach that I really, um, it just resonates with me as far as 
wanting to love her kids. Well, she Mm -hmm. wants to love her kids well and, um, and send them off well. Mm -hmm. And so if you're parenting teenagers and that's you, uh, I think she's honest too. And so I always appreciate that, that it's not just here's the three steps and you're going to have a great time, but she recognizes the reality and, uh, how precious our kids are at the same time. Yeah. And she comes from a Christian perspective, which is great. And she's a counselor. So yeah, highly recommend. I would say, I just want to give a shout out to remind parents of the power of Christian camps and it doesn't really matter. Well, it does matter. The quality does matter, but I'm sure people can find one in their local area that is, you know, running and doing a great job. I would do a little bit of research and ask around and find out. But I think what's so great about Christian camps is that they get away from their parents, which is actually Mm -hmm. healthy for them. And I've actually heard helps prepare them for college. So Mm -hmm. I think that's actually another benefit, um, kind of gets them used to being away for a short duration of time. Um, it gets them away from their parents where they can feel free to think and to explore. It gets them in nature off of their technology because most of the camps don't allow technology while they're there, which is so good for them to go a whole week without it. And then also it exposes them to these incredible young people who are working there or volunteering their time and they're amazing. And they get to see those really healthy role models and those people are pouring into them. And so I just, it's so good. And I just want to mention a few, um, of course in our area, if you're in the Northwest camp Spalding is the best and I'm a huge fan and young life camps are everywhere. They're all over the country and the world even. Um, and they do a lot of fundraising. So I think Young Life does such a great job to get every kid to camp who wants to go to camp. So if your child wants to go to Young Life camp, but can't afford it, if you contact the Young Life leaders, they'll find a way to get your kid there. They will. Um, Canacuck does a great job. I've never been to their camps, but I have several friends who, who on a regular basis attend those. JH Ranch in California, they actually have parent child camps. And that, if you're really struggling with one of your kids could be a really powerful thing and it's adventure based. So you do high adventure, but there's a high spiritual component with every physical risk that's being taken. And it's really powerful. Um, and then forest home in California is a really big well-known camp that a lot of people go to. So yeah. And I would, I would say if, if price is an issue, if you're feeling nervous about that, um, look at your denomination, if you're part of it or, or doesn't even have to be your denomination. Some of the older mainline denominations have camps, um, the Methodist church, the Lutheran church, and they have them locally. And so they're not trying to attract families from around the country. Um, they tend to be a little more, uh, price friendly. So don't let price just automatically be the issue. I think Camp Spalding is a good example. It's it's kind of a local, smaller camp and, and can be more affordable. Well, and I have honestly never heard of a family that has gone to a Christian camp and said, I really want my kid to go to camp and we can't afford it. I've really never heard of the camp not finding a way for that kid to go to camp. I mean, yeah. Cause I've been a part of lots of different camps and they always find a way for a kid to go. So I just want to encourage parents in that too. Like just, you know, I know it's a step of vulnerability to mm-hmm. say we're struggling here to get our kid to camp, but do it because it really is that important, you know, for your child. And then I would just say, um, you know, FCA, if your school has one, figure out if they do. That's another great resource where they can connect with actual coaches and teachers at their school who are Christians and who are safe people. And so I think that's a great resource for your child at their school. Um, and just to clarify, that's Fellowship of Christian Athletes. Mm-hmm. But you don't have, you to, don't be have to be an athlete. Okay. But you actually don't have to be an athlete. Anybody can go. And then of course, Young Life, you know, is at the high school as well. See if you have one. And then I would mention Meg Meeker's podcast. We've had her on the show before and she has her own podcast. 
that is about, um, she tackles, she's a, she's a, um, no, I think she's a general practitioner. She's an MD. Um, but she also just has lots of experts on and she tackles hard topics. Like I listened to, a. Uh, a two-part series she did on transgender. And so, I mean, she tackles hard things, but things that parents are experiencing in the teen years. So mm -hmm. really helpful. Okay. Well, we are grateful that you have tuned in the last few episodes to be part of this conversation. And we know that this can be a really hard time uh, in families, in homes. And like Krista said, you have a moment where you think, oh my gosh, I can't believe I raised this incredible person. He or she is going to do such amazing things in the world. And I'm so blessed to be their parent. And then you have another moment where you think, could they just leave? It would just be, <laughs> it would just, and they're thinking the same about us. I, oh, yeah. I, it's just a tense time of separation of, and that's what's happening is kids are separating from us and that's hard for us. And we can't, see it often that that's what's happening. And they certainly can't, they're not consciously thinking now I'm going to separate from my parents because that's developmentally what I'm supposed to do. Mm -hmm. It just creates tension, that whole process. So we wanted to end today's episode, um, by saying a prayer over you, the listener, if you're listening, we're going to assume that you're a mom just for this particular prayer that you have listened to this series, because you want to parent your children in the best way possible. Maybe they're not teenagers yet. Maybe they're heading in that direction. Um, or maybe you're in the thick of it. Either way, we know that God is with you and loves you and loves your children. So let me close us with a prayer today. Heavenly father, how good it is that you are our father that as we parent, we can go to you and say, I don't know what to do. I don't know what's next. I'm afraid. I'm nervous. I'm excited that we have you as our resource for comfort, for wisdom, for truth, that when we get stuck in the whirlwind of the teenage years, of the big emotions or no emotions of our own emotions that we can come to you and know that you do not change, that your goodness is constant and that you love us and you love our children and you love our spouses. And that in all of this time of growth and change for our kids, that you are present and Lord help us to remember Help our listeners to remember that you were with them when their babies were conceived. You were with them in those early years of mothering and you are with them now. You are with moms and teenagers, both. You sit next to us as we grieve, as we celebrate, and you go before us. You are waiting in the years ahead in the moments that we are already anticipating we're afraid of, or that we are hoping for. You are already there and waiting for us and for our kids as they grow and step out into the world outside of our homes. Thank you for that. We pray a special time of comfort over the mom listening today. Lord, help her to know that you see her, that you love her, that you are her perfect parent and that she can come to you in all of these times. Give her an extra dose of patience today, an extra dose of encouraging words, an extra dose of energy to face maybe a hard conversation she doesn't want to have. We love her and Lord, we know you love her beyond our understanding. Help her to know that too. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.